Welcome to our second annual XR at Michigan Summit. We're so excited to have everyone join us. Uh, we have folks coming from all over the world. Uh, this is really exciting. Uh, I'm really happy to, to be here. Happy to see all the folks connecting in. Yeah, feel free to check in on the chat. Uh, say where you're calling in from or you know, connecting in from. We'd love to see where everybody is in the world. And we have a great uh, set of talks for you today and a great summit this year. We're doing a hybrid event. Uh, so we'll have all day today virtual and then tomorrow for the folks around in and around Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, we'll have an in-person exhibit hall and student showcase. So we are excited. Uh, welcome everyone. Yes, feel free to, to check in on the chat and see where you are. It'd be great. All right, so we are gonna kick it off and get started here. So welcome again to our XR at Michigan 2022 Summit. Uh, just to refresh folks like what we are. So uh, my name is Jeremy Nelson. I am the director of the Extended Reality Initiative at the University of Michigan. And we have been focused on bringing XR technologies to the university community. And we were given three main goals uh, to integrate these XR technologies into the residential curricula for all 19 schools and colleges. So this is the on-campus environment. Integrate these tools into our online curricula. As part of the Center for Academic Innovation, we work with creating massive open online courses, teach outs, uh, content that's accessed by uh, people globally, um, every country on the planet, over 200 courses we've created on platforms such as Coursera, edX, and FutureLearn. And then finally, uh, we were tasked with creating innovative public-private partnerships. And so you'll hear about some of that today. Um, just to remind folks, we have an XR curriculum uh, here at Michigan. We launched an XR graduate certificate in the fall of 2020. So students in a master's program can enroll uh, in the graduate certificate. They take 12 credits, they do a capstone project, uh, an internship, and there are already courses being offered from 12 of our 19 schools and colleges uh, today. And so you'll see some of those projects in the uh, student showcase as part of the Hopin platform here. You can check those out anytime later today or tomorrow or the rest of the week. And then additionally, we have an XR for Everybody massive open online course specialization on Coursera. Uh, and these are really focused on the knowing, doing, and shaping the future of XR. So if you haven't taken that, we'll pop a link uh, in the chat here uh, for folks to check that out if you're interested after the event today. All right, so this is, uh, we've completed year two of the XR initiative. And so we wanna talk about some of the impact, some of the wins that we've had uh, in this last year. So a lot of exciting things happening uh, today. So uh, the approach that we've taken is we do an innovation, uh, innovation fund. Uh, so faculty pitch us ideas and how they wanna use XR technologies uh, in the classroom. So over the last two years, uh, we've received 33 proposals. Uh, we funded 24 projects uh, from 11 of the 19 schools and colleges. So you'll see we've got proposals in architecture, engineering, uh, our College of Literature, Science and the Arts, nursing, the med school, uh, dentistry, School of Information, the law school, our School of Music, Theater and Dance, our School of Sustainability and Environment, and the School of Social Work. And you'll get a chance today to hear from uh, all of these faculty innovators that we've worked with uh, in our breakout sessions uh, after our keynote. I just wanna highlight some of the, the key projects that our team has worked on over the last couple of years. Uh, we've created four large virtual reality projects, uh, one called Getting Under the Skin. This is a VR chemotherapy simulation for nursing students uh, and nurses to practice uh, delivering chemotherapy uh, in a VR setting. And so you'll get to hear more about that in a couple of the breakout sessions. And that has just been launched on the Oculus Store App Lab. And so that's now available uh, to anyone in the world. And so uh, folks that are interested in that, we'll be able to put a link out and, and share that information sh soon. Uh, we've created an XR physics lab. So this is a VR physics lab uh, to replicate some of the experiments uh, in the on-campus physics laboratory. And this was about a projectile motion uh, experiment. We've recreated the Ford nuclear reactor uh, that was on campus for well over 50 years. Uh, it's been decommissioned and we have recreated it in virtual reality and now students can go into a headset and explore uh, what this reactor uh, looked like. They can run simulations. You can go into the reactor core. Uh, and For the folks coming to our day two tomorrow, you'll have a chance to try that out uh, at our exhibit hall. 
And then finally, we created a augmented tectonics virtual reality experience. And so this is Professor Jonathan Rule in our College of Architecture and Urban Planning, uh, where he teaches uh, design principles uh, around steel, glass, wood, concrete. And uh, so he teaches the lecture and then the students can go into virtual reality and explore those different modules. So there's design challenges in the wood module, uh, in the concrete module, in the steel module. And so they can understand the concepts uh, a little bit deeper there. Uh, and last year, we funded uh, 14 new projects and three HoloLens 2 projects, a mobile AR projects, project, and then 10 360 video projects, really focused around skill development, language learning, um, having difficult conversations. You'll see on the right there uh, an example of an interactive 360 video experience where uh, from an English language uh, institute. And so the students, uh, their non-native English speakers can practice kind of conversational uh, English as they navigate around campus through this interactive experience. So you get to hear more about that later today. Uh, one of the ways we've made this possible is with the incredible work of our XR student fellows. Uh, we've been able to hire 36 students over the last two years from all across campus, a really interdisciplinary team uh, from architecture students, art and design, uh, School of Music, Information, Engineering, School of Ed, and they get to work on many things with our projects. They help us with project management. They help us with storyboarding, uh, development. Uh, we won an Epic Games Mega Grant last year to hire students and teach them how to build XR experiences with Unreal Engine. Uh, they do prototyping, uh, built some Instagram and Snapchat filters uh, so you can check some of those out uh, on those platforms, but they've really been critical uh, to our success and the work we've been able to do with faculty here at Michigan and helping prepare the students uh, to go out and, and change the world uh, with XR. And so I wanna talk a little bit about uh, last year at last year's XR Summit, uh, we held a social networking VR uh, reception on a recreation of our Diag, which is the center of our campus. And so we had two students work on that. Uh, it was a great event. We had about 200 folks show up from all across the, the globe last year. It was a great experience. And then we've really taken that and now started to build out, you know, what started helping us think about what our contribution to the metaverse might look like and how we might begin to, to hold classes online. We've actually done that uh, this last semester and the previous semester. Uh, Professor Rebecca Quintana, a colleague of ours, uh, she taught a course this last semester where students met up uh, in VR headsets uh, on the Diag. So I'm going to show you a little video about that right now. The Diag really represents the university. It, it represents campus. It represents our community. It's the crossroads of everything. There's been so much loss in this pandemic. I think for here at the university, for students, staff and faculty, the Diag is the center of campus. We wanted to give that back. So I proposed recreating the Diag in 3D. I love it, I love it, I love it. It's beautiful. This is really, this is really well done. Our day-to-day -day process was really based on trying to recreate an individual building at a time. So what that would involve is going and gathering reference images, map data, and 3D models to then build on top of. Oh, wow. The idea of creating a space where people could gather and share ideas. It's so inspiring to see what's happening here at Michigan. Was a very exciting idea to me. I met people from London, from Ecuador. I met somebody from Jordan. I'm based in the UK. Creating an environment in a digital space is interesting because it can bring together new communities of global learners that may never be able to come to campus. We recreated it as truthfully as we could within our constraints, and it felt right. It, felt to me that I was on campus. It was kind of a wonderful feeling to be back, to really just be together again. Seeing other people experience it for the first time, it, you know, it gave me this very, very overwhelming sense of accomplishment. I think the Diag is the most important symbolic place we have. Having it available virtually is uh, it's a great way to reconnect and, uh, and helps me feel a little bit more connected to the place that I love. Great. Uh, that was just a really exciting 
uh, opportunity for the students. It was a really great uh, event we had last year. I mean, I was just really impressed with what the students were able to, to, to build. It really started off with just an idea of like, hey, do you think we could do this? Uh, and I mentioned that to George uh, on a Friday and like on Monday, he's like, hey, look what I did. And he'd already started to build a model in Blender uh, based on some uh, Street View data. And so it was just, it was a really great example of like when we give students opportunities, what amazing things they can do. Uh, and, and in terms of collaborations, we've done, been able to do some great work uh, over the last year. Uh, we've partnered with our colleagues, uh, Dr. Courtney Cogburn from Columbia and Professor Jeremy Valenson from Stanford uh, to take, to work with them on the amazing project that they created, A Thousand Cut Journey, uh, and help transition that uh, from a previous uh, version of the software that could only run on a desktop PC VR solution uh, and helped convert that into Unreal Engine. Uh, and now we're working to make that available uh, on the Oculus Quest 2. And so we're, we're in discussions uh, to make that available globally uh, through the Oculus Store. So we'll be talking about that um, hopefully very soon, but we'll see. We just wanted to help them in a way that allows us you know, more people to experience this, this great work. Uh, and it's been a, a fantastic collaboration uh, between all the institutions. Uh, other, other collaborations over this last year, uh, we've worked really closely with the XR Association and the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, to help write up uh, some documents on what, is, what are some of the concerns around data privacy and security. What else can be done with XR that isn't just gaming uh, to really help influence legislation and policy, uh, hopefully, uh, to make sure you know we have stronger uh, regulations in place uh, to help protect uh, users of these technologies. We've worked with Educause um, and run two XR learning labs, worked with colleagues at Georgia Tech and the New School uh, and Ricky LaFosse on our team uh, to deliver these learning labs really focused on ethics, privacy, and security as you're setting up XR at your institution. Uh, and then a really exciting project you'll hear a little bit about, you'll hear more about a little bit later, uh, is the HoloLens, Microsoft HoloLens Dynamics 360 Guide, 365 Guides project. Uh, and we've been collaborating with the NHS in the UK, in particular their Health Education England group, on how could we share these guides and help uh, upskill and train uh, healthcare workforce across the entire country uh, and collaborating on guides that we've built here at the School of Nursing uh, with their folks in England. And then just hot off the presses, uh, the University of Michigan uh, partnered with the University of Maryland and was awarded an NSF center grant, uh, a center for medical innovations in XR. So they'll be collaborating around uh, computer science and engineering and medical innovation uh, both at a university level, a health system level, and with uh, companies like Microsoft and Apple and Sony uh, to how, really study how these technologies are really going to impact uh, medical innovations. All right, so today uh, we have an exciting set of talks. Uh, we're going to kick off with a keynote from Microsoft, Jeremy Schreiber, and I'll introduce him here in a second. We'll have a series of faculty panels. You'll have a choice between two different panels. Uh, that you can uh, participate in from 2 to 2.30 Eastern and then 2.30 to 3 Eastern. Uh, all of them will be recorded. So if you aren't able to attend one of them now, uh, you will be able to uh, review those later. So, so don't worry about that. Um, we're going to come back uh, from those sets of faculty panels. We'll talk a little bit back here on the main stage um, around some of the XR soft skill development, some of the collaborations we're doing internally here with our HR department at the University of Michigan. And we'll break out again into a, a series of panels uh, from 3.30 to 4.30 Eastern. Uh, there's a student showcase that's available uh, anytime in the student showcase part of Hopin here that you can go check out some of the work that our students have built. Uh, these are projects that students did at Michigan uh, using XR uh, throughout their coursework uh, in their programs. And then uh, please join us back uh, at the end of the day at 4.30 Eastern for a very special announcement uh, between the University of Michigan and Coursera. And we look forward to talking more about that. And then tomorrow, if you're in or around the Ann Arbor area, we're holding our first in-person uh, event. 
This will be at the Rogo Ballroom at the Michigan Union. It's running from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern. There'll be a student showcase. So the students, you'll be able to see them all here in Hopin. Uh, but for students that wanted to present in person and you want to see their work in person, uh, you can come between 11 and 12 or 2 to 3 to see those uh, showcase presentations. Uh, there's a vendor exhibit hall. We have uh, Microsoft, HP, uh, the Ann Arbor Spark has funded a number of startups around Ann Arbor that have booths. So you can try out various different VR, AR, some games, some medical, some architecture. We just wanted to give folks a chance to try out these technologies and try out these experiences. Uh, we have free swag and refreshments. So I'd love anyone to come attend. Uh, that's in and around. It's open to the public. Anybody can attend. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you all there tomorrow. I really want to take this time to, to, to thank all the people that made this possible. Our XR team here, Moezel Salim, Eric Schreffler, our, uh, Trevor Parnell, Jeff Butler, uh, Amelia Berry, our XR innovators and residents, Michael Niebling, Michelle Abersold, and Jonathan Rule. You can hear from them a little bit later in one of those first sessions. Uh, some of our XR student fellows, Hope Mao, Jihee Yoon, and Yingwen Liu. And thank you to our sponsors, uh, Microsoft, HP, and Ann Arbor Spark. We really appreciate everything uh, making this possible. All right, so now I am excited to introduce Jeremy Schreiber from Microsoft. Jeremy is a director in the Microsoft Mixed Reality Product Group, where he serves as the commercial lead for Mesh Enterprise, managing strategic partnerships, ecosystem development, and commercialization efforts for Microsoft Mesh, Altspace VR, and other mixed reality initiatives. Prior to joining Microsoft, Jeremy founded the Silicon Valley chapter of the VR AR Association and started the XR business at Flex, the second largest contract manufacturer in the world. In nearly 10 years at Advanced Micro Devices, AMD, he designed semiconductor circuits for computer chips publishing several patents and publications and led global teams to significantly reduce chip power consumption and redesign CAD software to focus on efficient and intuitive user interfaces. Across his career, he has worked in product management, corporate strategy, corporate finance, and has led new product introductions in factories in Hungary and China. Jeremy has a BS and a master's in engineering in electrical and computer engineering from Cornell University and received his MBA from Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Schreiber. Hey, everybody. I'm super excited to be here. Thank you so much, Jeremy, for hosting this event. Um, I think this is wonderful that you're able to pull so many people from all over the world together um, to learn uh, about XR and mixed reality. Um, and these are just such exciting times for the field. It's really a pivotal time for, for mixed reality um, in general, for the entire XR industry. Um, as we've gone to, to a point in time where the technologies are really enabling uh, a mass transformation and new capabilities. So I know our time here is short, but I'm excited to share just a little bit about some of the really cool things that are happening in the space, um, how Microsoft is viewing mixed reality and how we really believe this is gonna transform uh, the future of how we all learn together and how we grow our skill sets. Um, so thank you so much. Super excited to be here. And of course, for, for all the people that are here from the University of Michigan or UM alums, I want to extend a heartfelt go blue. Um, okay, so I want to start by giving a little bit of the perspective on how Microsoft views mixed reality. So we really believe that this is huge. Right? This isn't just you know, some, some random new technology that we're dabbling in. We really believe this is the next major evolution in computing. So the world has gone from going from you know, mainframe computers to, to having software on your personal computers to a mobile shift where everyone carries a phone in their pocket and is connected to the internet. Well, the next major generation of that is going to be mixed reality, where you experience content in context in the real world. This is going to be how all of our interactions are done in the world, and it's going to completely transform how computing is done in every aspect of your life. And when we talk about mixed reality, there's a lot of questions of, well, what does that mean? Is it virtual reality? Is it augmented reality? Is it something in between? And really, it covers the entire spectrum of any way you're adding in virtual people, places, things, and experiences 
across the spectrum from the physical world to the virtual world. So you can almost imagine having a headset on and having a transparency slider like you would have in Photoshop, where if you have it slid all the way to opaque, you're painting an entirely virtual world. And if you were to slide that slider all the way to transparent, you're able to see things in the physical world. But all of those other experiences and, and you know people that are being painted in, those objects and those experiences, those are all there existing in the world in a persistent way that can be interacted regardless of where you are um, and regardless of your physical location. Um, and, and a key part of that is the ability to make these objects persistent. So when you walk away from a room and you come back later, those objects remain and you can continue to interact with them across time and space. So rather than me trying to explain what that looks like, I think it's a lot easier if I put for you a, a video that shows a vision of how this is all gonna come together. Uh, Trevor, could you uh, play the video for us? Connection is a spark that gives our lives meaning. It drives us to seek out others who feel the same way. Okay, why don't you input the data and we'll take a look together. Hey, Mari, what you got for me? To find those who share our views, yet offer different perspectives. Saw this net. Look over here. Challenge us with new ways of seeing. Deepen our understanding and enrich our lives. Great things happen when we commit to something bigger than ourselves. Let's take a closer look at it. Place this here. Let's see how we go from there, okay? This sense of collaboration and the feelings of connection it brings excites us. Hey, just in time. I'm going to move it slightly, okay? It's yours, take it. We have two planes right now on the same trajectory. As we put people first, technology fades into the background and feels like anything but. Asia, what do you think? I think if we had 330, maintaining 2800, we'll be clear for approach. Excellent. This changes the way we see the world and in turn, changes the world we see. These numbers are looking great, actually. There's promise in the possibilities. And what we see and create next will stretch the imagination. Good morning, Sarah. Morning. Slowly coming towards the thumb. A world without boundaries. Good job. A lot better than yesterday. Yeah. Excellent. Slowly bring the A world where technology enhances, not limits, humanity. With people front, center and in the spotlight the future is here and here can be anywhere introducing microsoft mesh So I love watching that video. It gets me uh, inspired every time. Um, so what you're seeing in there is a combination of the HoloLens 2, which is our mixed reality headset. Most of you have probably heard about it by now, um, but it's it's been in the market for a few years. And you're also seeing our mesh mixed reality services, um, which are, are continuing to evolve on, on a weekly basis. Um, this is a set of tools that are already in existence today, and we're working on building an entire ecosystem around this. Um, for, for what the future of collaboration is going to look like. And that's the common theme that you're going to see throughout all of this, is it's really about how people can come together across time and space and collaborate across anything that they need to do. Um, but while that's sort of the future vision of how it's all going to come together, let's pivot a little bit and talk about some of the use cases, specifically in education, and how that's already being realized in universities today. So a couple of the areas I wanted to dive into with some examples are augmented teaching, experiential learning, um, and hollow assessments. And what I want to point out about this is these are not future visions. This is not something that's way off in the distance that you have to dream about. Look at the logos on this page. There should be a lot of familiar universities, including right here at University of Michigan. Like These are happening right now. 
universities are experimenting and rolling out different programs. And I expect to see in the next couple of years, this is going to start to become a much broader part of the way the university curriculum starts to get deployed in a much more mainstream way. So keep your eyes out and start asking questions of the faculty um, to make sure you start getting enrolled and start experiencing these types of curriculum. So let's start by talking about augmented teaching. I remember, you know, most of my curriculum and most of my classes involved sitting in a lecture in a classroom where the teachers talked up on stage with a whiteboard behind me um, or reading materials in a book on a 2D page with 2D pictures. Um, it's often hard to illustrate difficult concepts. You know, an example was taking an architecture course where the professor was describing complex physical geometries that were taking place in a 3D structure in a building while putting a 2D slide up on the board in a building. And it was very hard to grasp that concept. But now imagine if that building could leap off the page right in front of you on your desk and you could pick up that building and rotate it and really see what is happening um, in that building, highlight that geometry, dig in and really explore it personally. Or if you're in a chemistry class and you really want to understand what's happening with the chemical reaction, actually being able to have the professor walk you through that right in front of you and have that personal view dynamic, not static like it is in a book. It really brings that course material to life. And these are concepts that are starting to happen today. And the best part is because it can happen right in front of you as a hologram or in virtual reality, you're not even bound by the constraints of operating in a classroom. This can take place anywhere in the world. In fact, that's exactly what happened with Case Western Reserve University. They piloted an experience um, with their, their, um, their medical uh, classes in their med school where during the pandemic, they couldn't bring their students to class on campus. So instead, they actually sent some 97 HoloLens 2 headsets to, uh, to their students all over the country. And with the HoloLens headset, they were able to reproduce a cadaver lab doing dissections and exploring human anatomy um, and actually using the Holland hollow anatomy software, able to really teach students how different parts of the body connected, exploring the central nervous system and muscular skeletal systems. Um, and they are actually able to learn and have much higher retention rates than students that didn't have access to this. In fact, people were actually able to see structures in the bodies through these simulations that they weren't able to see with real cadavers. And of course, a side benefit of this is they didn't have to ship any dead bodies to people's houses. So it was kind of a win-win all around. Another major area that you're starting to see benefits from are experiential learning. Um, and it really changes the way you participate in labs. So if you think about the way your typical labs and other experiential learning courses come, you often open up complex manuals where you have to read detailed instructions. How do I perform this? There's a lot of overhead and reading, trying to understand what's being said looking at 2D manuals and trying to intuit, what exactly is it asking me to do in this picture? Well, with the HoloLens 2 paired with uh, Dynamics 365 Guides, which is a first party piece of Microsoft software, and uh, Jeremy mentioned this earlier that um, University of Michigan is working with this as well, um, you're actually able to build a set of complex instructions um, through the headset that not only writes the instructions in text, but is able to populate a video in three dimensions as well as actually highlight the objects and give you those complex instructions in real time. Um, it can highlight screws, bolts, um, test tubes, any other objects, and actually show you what step needs to be done and how to do it. The best way I can highlight that is an example that really brought this home for me. I walked into a demonstration where there was a Boeing jet engine, an incredibly complex expensive piece of machinery that requires years of training to learn how to operate on. And for me to learn how to do this would be an incredible feat. And yet with this demo, I was able to learn how to do a complex wiring instruction by putting on a HoloLens and literally following a set of step-by-step -step guides where the particular wire I needed to pick up highlighted, showed me how to thread it through an assembly, move it to the location where I needed to assemble it, pick up the right tool, tighten the bolt, and then find the test switch to highlight the circuit and see that it actually worked. So within seconds, I was able to complete a job on a very complicated assembly that would have taken me hours to figure out if I were trying to read through complex manuals and assembly instructions. Uh, really amazing what this technology can do. Um, and in fact, Northeastern University started doing this in some of their medical labs um, for, for their students, and they were able to decrease their time uh, to get people up and running in labs um, by 83%, taking a three hour lesson plan and being able to reduce it down into under 30 minutes. Um, it's really amazing. Um, and on top of that, 
because you're not spending so much time reading the instruction manual, you actually get to focus your time and attention on the material you're trying to learn. I mean, it really helps reinforce these lessons. It actually makes the labs and, and the work you're trying to do a lot more fun and a lot more interesting as you focus on the learning. And the last piece, and I love this example here, is, is thinking about different ways you can actually test the learning that you've achieved. So here's an example of a piece of software called GigXR, um, Holopatient. GigXR is the company, Holopatient is the software. Um, and in here, you're actually able to do medical assessments. Um, that person that you're seeing here is an actor demonstrating a different type of ailment. And the students that are around them, the, the nurses and doctors in this case, have hollow lenses on their head. Um, that actor is not actually there. That's a hologram of an actor, but that's a real bed in a real hospital environment. And so the students are able to walk around and see a hologram of that actor in various scenarios, along with diagnostic information, vitals, and other symptoms that are popping up, walk around and then try to test and diagnose what's actually happening with that patient in a way that you never could do before without costly actors and other types of costly simulations. And again, this can be done from anywhere in the world um, and you can actually have multiple people collaborating across space to do this. Um, it's just amazing the way you can change testing and experiential learning. So these are just a couple of examples of how this applies to, to education while you're in school, um, but it doesn't stop there. The, the possibilities are limitless and it really extends as you're trying to prepare to go into the workforce. So I wanna look uh, at some examples. Uh, Accenture is another company that's been partnering very closely with Microsoft and they've completely shifted the way they welcome people into the workforce and how they continue them on their path of learning and development. So when you join a company, it used to be, here's your laptop and here's your phone. Nowadays, it's here's your laptop, here's your phone, and here's your VR headset. Sorry, I don't know if you can see it because it breaks up a little from the virtual set, but here's your laptop, your phone, and your VR headset. And your new employee orientation, part of it actually takes place in virtual reality. And so again, you have people coming into this massive consulting firm that's global, and they can come together into a spatial environment and collaborate no matter where they are and actually make friends actually have real face-to-face -face interactions in a metaverse or immersive space environment that they could never do in the real world without having to fly people in uh, into a common headquarters. And they can create magical experiences and simulations that you couldn't do in a real world environment. It also goes beyond that into helping you build up some of the skills that you need in the workforce. And these are the kind of skills that you don't necessarily get in school when you're taking your, your specific subject matter classes. So a great example of this is public speaking. Uh, it's often said that our, our famous quote you'll hear is that people fear public speaking more than they fear death, which I guess makes me pretty brave, but uh, I'm surviving, so we're doing all right. Um, but for a lot of people, the only way you get to practice public speaking is to go out in front of a large audience and public speak. And that usually ends up being some sort of a catastrophe with sweaty palms. You usually make some sort of a fool of yourself. It's terrible, you're pretty embarrassed. It usually is a mess. What if you could do that by putting on a VR headset and going into a virtual conference room or a virtual stage? And now you have other people that can join the room or not even real people. You can have virtual bots that show up in the room and they can give you real time feedback on your presentation. You can use artificial intelligence um, and speech monitoring to really be able to understand the pace of your conversation, your eye contact, are you saying um a lot as you're communicating and give you this type of feedback and help you rehearse and practice over and over again? So by the time you need to go out in the real world, you've already built up those capabilities and you feel much more confident and you, you've decreased the risk of having to do that in front of a live audience. And this is just one of many of these types of skill sets you can practice by taking advantage of these virtual reality environments. Um, so lastly, um, before we switch over, I've got another video I want to share with you that really kind of drives home the vision of how learning can change, how a classroom experience can change, and how you can really start to understand how mixed reality can transform the way you can learn and be a part of lessons as opposed to be just a casual observer. Uh, Trevor, if you could hit play on this for us. When we commit to something bigger than ourselves, and when the mission at hand has global benefit. Benefit that impacts environmental understanding, conservation, and global ecology. 
not to mention has deep impact in education and science. I'm not only inspired by it, but also proud to be part of the journey. Like the anglerfish that using a glowing lure to attract its food, a bioluminescent bobble that dangles in front of its hidden maw. And so we wondered, could we use the same anglerfish approach to draw in the elusive giant squid? It was on Ocean X's Aleutia, operating off Japan in 2012, that we tried just this, attracting the most famous squid of all, the legendary giant squid. Eight muscular arms plus two insanely long tentacles, all growing out of a massive cone-shaped head, a parrot-like beak that can rip flesh, a jet propulsion system that works equally well in forward or reverse, and gargantuan eyes bigger than those of any other animal on Earth. Awesome. So l let me unpack a little bit about what you just saw in that video. So for starters, when that giant squid popped out here, and mind you, all those participants that you're seeing in the audience, they're there in virtual reality, either on their desktop as if they were in a video game environment or in a proper VR headset. But you can have somebody try to describe to you what a giant squid looks like and what its different structures look like. But when you're in a VR headset and you're underwater and this giant squid starts swimming over your head and you see its eye is staring at you, you absorb that. It hits you in a way that you just can't imagine otherwise. Um, and this, this will help you learn any other type of content in a way that's just never before been experienced. Um, and other things that you're seeing in here are holoportation. And so if you look at the beginning, that was Alex Kitman, the inventor of the HoloLens and the original Xbox Connect cameras and the like. Um, he was beamed in in a full 360 degrees. Likewise, the two professors that are here um, from OceanX, they're beamed in from different locations um, across the world, and they were able to position themselves side by side, 360 degrees. You could walk around them as if they were right there in the middle of that conference room or in the middle of that stage while we're able to recreate that underwater environment. Um, it's just, it's, it really transports you into the environment so you can truly feel the material and absorb it in a way. Like you, you always hear the, the, the concept of um, uh, show, don't tell. This really emphasizes the show part of storytelling and will really transform the way you learn and absorb content. So the last point I want to highlight on this is how is this happening today and how are we, how are we bringing this to the world? Um, we all envision a world where everybody walks around with a HoloLens or an XR mixed reality headset on their head. And this is great, but it's also not realistic today. This is expensive. It's quite big. And while it's great for certain niche environments, we're not in a world where everybody's going to wear one of these on a daily basis. And even if you jump into a VR headset, this is much cheaper. Um, it's a little bit more available to the masses, but it's still not something where everybody is ready to be walking around wearing these on a daily basis. And so at Microsoft, we're recognizing that. And so we're making sure that as we build our products, we make them available on 2D first. So everybody can access these on their computers on their laptops. And so you can jump into a world as an avatar or an immersive space on the devices you have today and start to, to envelop yourself in these immersive spaces, start to join immersive meetings, start to collaborate with your peers and your classmates. And over time, as you start to adopt these virtual reality and mixed reality technologies with headsets, we'll be there to help you along that journey. Um, but it's critical that people can start adapting to these technologies now. Um, and so we're excited that this is happening now and Microsoft and the mixed reality team, we're here to help you along the journey. And once again, we're thrilled to be partnering with universities like the University of Michigan to really help make this, this a possibility. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeremy. That was great. Uh, really exciting stuff happening at Microsoft. Like you've been a great partner for the University of Michigan. Uh, and it was just, it was, it was great to hear some of those examples, see how other universities, see how companies are thinking about this. You know, we think a lot about kind of where that intersection of kind of future of work and how the skills and upskilling for the workforce, uh, how these technologies can support that, you know, after students uh, graduate and leave the University of Michigan or kind of our online learners as, as they upskill through courses like 
uh, Dr. Michael Niebling's XR for everybody, which I just put a link there in the chat. Uh, if folks are interested in taking that, that'd be great. Um, yeah, this is this is great. Well, uh, I have a few questions for you, and then we'd love to open it up to the audience for some questions. So if you have questions for us, please throw those in the chat there, and, and we can talk about ones that we can. Uh, so, Jeremy, what are some of the challenges you see in adopting mixed reality technologies? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. There's a bunch of challenges, and I started to touch on a couple of them. The first is uh, the hardware itself can be very limiting. So um, size and form factor are a big challenge. So I'm going to put this back on again. There are a lot of people that don't want to walk around in public dressed like this. So for tech heads like me and my, my coworkers, this is great. We don't mind. We think this looks cool. I yep. know. What do you think? Is this a good look? <laughs> but I don't not mind. everybody wants to, to walk around looking like this. So they would much rather the headsets look like these glasses, like you and I are both wearing right now. Um, and so that's the big factor is we need to get the technology shrunk down like that. And the only way to really get it to this kind of form factor is to get a lot of the weight and a lot of the computing off of our heads and into the cloud. That yep. also means we need powerful cloud computing and we need technologies like 5G to be able to ensure that we have super low latency connectivity yep. going from, from your head to the cloud or uh, capabilities like edge computing. So you can have cloud computing that's super nearby and distributed everywhere. So we need to make sure it's super quick to be able to do computing nearby. We need better battery technology. Um, and that's just one major area is focusing on the technology and the form factor reduction. Um, another thing is there, there are cultural shifts that go on. So uh, for those people that don't wear glasses, trying to get them to wear something on their head is very difficult. This is right. the most expensive real estate on your body. And so even for someone who wears glasses, I'd rather not be wearing them if I didn't have to. Agreed. And so put something on over top of it, that can be a difficult selling point. Um, there are you know, options to hold up an iPad or some other tablet device, but that gets tiring and exhausting. And yeah. so um, there's a lot of different challenges that you face on that. Um, and then you, know, you kind of get into you know, what happens when you go into the workforce. There are a lot of, of companies that don't know how to manage this yet, or you don't know how to deploy fleets of devices. You don't have device management and application management on these uh, the devices that are out there. It's just yep. it hasn't gone mainstream enough to, to deal with it yet. Um, you haven't built up the, the cultural norms around people going into meeting rooms with VR devices on their headset. Like, do you put your VR headset on? Do you open your laptop? Is it some mix of the two? Do you not go into a conference room and sit at your desk? There's a whole bunch of just cultural norms that we have to think through and work through. Um, and we're just very new in that. And so we're actually, it's a very important part of the learning process for us and for our partners out in the field to really be driving this and testing these pieces and helping to, to start to shape that is help us find that product market fit, if you will. Um, and so, you know, it's one of the reasons actually we love working with you is to see, you know, what happens when you put these in students' hands? What are they going to love? What are they going to hate? And, you know, what do we get to hear back? And how can we tweak the products to, to make that better? Yeah, I mean, everything you just said rang true to <laughs> almost everything we've experienced the last two years, right? Like the headset, there is, you know, we talk about a normative context. There isn't a normative context for these devices yet, right? Many yeah. people know how to use a computer and a smartphone and there's, there's you can pick one up and, and figure it out pretty easily, but these devices, it's, it's, it's not completely intuitive yet. Like, how do I hold the controllers if there are controllers? How do I click? Where do I tap? Um, yeah, the battery life, the charging, you know, uh, accessibility for sure. Like, yeah. you know, some of the devices don't fit over my glasses or if I have larger rimmed glasses, you know, I can't, the device won't fit on my head. If, if people are prone to motion sickness, sometimes they just can't do the VR. Um, and we need to, you know, we think a lot about that accessibility and how do we create learning experiences that uh, everyone can participate in, right? And so that's, I see some questions here about 2D. And could you talk a little bit about how Microsoft thinks about accessibility? Because I would say in, in your Altspace platform, you have, you know, the most representation of avatars and avatar design that I've seen. And, I, and I, we really applaud that, having those options. Yeah, thank you. So we, we spend a lot of time focusing on diversity and inclusivity, um, accessibility being a key piece of that. Um, from the sort of diversity which you start and inclusivity which you start alluding to, um, first of all, our teams at Microsoft are incredibly diverse. So the, the first key part is making sure the people that are designing our avatars and dividing, designing our systems um, are diverse. So by design, we're not introducing systemic biases into the very things that we're building. 
Um, and then the second thing is as we're building out our future avatar systems, we're trying to think through and test with users on a regular basis, working with our user research teams to make sure we factor in things like, um, you know, racial preferences, skin tones, body sizes and shapes. Um, we actually don't have, you know, specific gender differences in the body types. We let you, you know, just shift sliders for every aspect and proportion of your body without identifying it as masculine or feminine. Um, but we add in things like, um, you know, headwear that can be religious or non-religious, prosthetic limbs, uh, things like wheelchairs, anything to make you people feel included regardless of their situation, whether in a real environment or in that virtual environment. And even the way we're building the environments, we want to make sure that no matter how you access the world, you feel included. Because some people are going to dial in on their phones. Some people are going to come into worlds on their laptops and PCs. Some are going to come in and view our headsets and some are AR headsets. We want to make sure nobody feels like a second or third class citizen. Everybody should have an equal seat at the playing field or at the table. Um, and so there's a lot of open discussions that are happening every day within the company to think through these things. And it's, it's not easy. There are no slam dunk answers to this. There's a, a lot of heated, intense discussions and debates that happen. Um, but the key thing is we have to be having these conversations early and often. Yeah. And we do. This has to be designed in from day one. It can't be an afterthought. Um, that's the, the, the cool thing about working for companies like Microsoft. And I, I've worked for a lot of companies in my career. I have never seen a company that takes diversity, inclusion, and accessibility as seriously all the way up from senior leadership at the Satya and Brad Smith level down to the individual engineers that are designing the product. I've never seen a company that both talks the talk and walks the walk the way Microsoft does. And you're going to see that in how we build our products. I love that. I love that. That's great. Yeah. I mean, we're having discussions here at Michigan and, and other institutions about, you know, uh, as students show up as avatars and what representation and how do they want to show up? And, and what does that mean if, if a faculty is teaching a course in VR, how do we know it's it's Jeremy Nelson showing up? <laughs> lots of things to figure out. It's not figured out. So, but just some, you know, some of these have been dealt with, and when folks show up with, you know, in the real life with different clothing and different ways of representing themselves. So, I, I just love that the options are there for you to customize uh, how you want to present yourself. And, and, well, and I was saying that's the other thing is you don't always want to show up looking like yourself. Sometimes yeah. you want to show up looking like somebody else because you don't feel like representing yourself as you that day. Um, and so we want to give you that capability too. Like if, if you want to show up looking completely different for whatever reason, like you have that capability too. And even simple things like having multiple avatars, you know, in the worlds that we build. So you can have your identical persona on day one and your crazy wild persona on another day when you feel like just lashing out and being wild. Like, you know, <laughs> right. however you want to show up and be yourself that day, we want you to be truly you. Um, and that's something you can really do with, with ease. And we're even making ways that you can show up with your camera on or your camera off, depending on how you're feeling that day. There's just a lot of different factors on how you choose to represent yourself. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Well, you know, in terms of mixed reality applications, we, we see a lot in healthcare. It just, it, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest here at Michigan and healthcare, and it, it makes sense to me. But where else do you see folks using mixed reality for training or for learning education? Oh, we're, we're seeing just tremendous use cases all over the map. It's anywhere where you want to be able to visualize things, especially when scale is involved or, or physical 3D objects. So design reviews are, are a really common use case that we see. So imagine automotive design is a great example. If you are Ford or Porsche and you want to do a design review and you have designers that are all over the world, right now, companies will build a giant clay model. So first you'll do a 2D simulation in some sort of AutoCAD on a computer screen where you're trying to visualize a giant car with all of its intricacies and curves and the way light reflects by looking at it 2D on a small computer screen, which you're already missing out a lot. Then the next step is, once you have people that have agreed on what that looks like, you actually build a giant clay model that people have to walk around. Well, the challenge is, A, those are very expensive, hard to manipulate and work with. They're time consuming to build. And if you want multiple people to look at it, you have to fly them in to get everybody in the same room to do that. Well, with mixed reality, people can exist or dial into this from wherever they are in the world. And you can build that sense of scale and that level of precision and rendering no matter where you are. 
you can walk around and visualize that car and be with your collaborators side by side as if you were right there in the room. You can make eye contact. You can compare notes with each other while you were looking at that car. And again, it's that sense of scale that really makes it different than just looking at it, you know, on a 2D model of some sort. And then the same thing happens when you look at something like the AEC industry, which is architecture, engineering, and construction. So across the life cycle of a building, there are just tons of different parties and stakeholders from designers and architects to different construction crews, people that are designing the, the girders, the support structures to the wiring and the plumbing and the pipes and all the various components that all have to go in together. And various people need to collaborate with other people at different points in time. And arranging that coordination between stakeholders can be incredibly challenging yes. from a time point of view, from a location point of view. And again, a lot of that design work takes place in 2D on a computer. You're trying to visualize a giant building in three dimensions with no actual sense of scale and proportions on a 2D screen, which is very tough. And so you can do this now in virtual reality, um, sitting at your desk and pull people in, you know, connecting with something like Mesh um, to actually come together and literally walk that building together and actually see how are these things coming together? Is the space actually creating that sense of flow that we were hoping it was going to have? Does it actually look the way we want? How does it work in with the rest of the landscape? And then when you go on site and you actually wanna start envisioning, how is this building going to look on the actual construction site? You can put on a HoloLens and actually start to envision what happens when that first floor goes up. How does that look? What happens if I need to do an engineering change order on the way the piping was drawn in? Or did the piping go the wrong way and it turns out it's gonna intersect with the wiring and now we have a collision? You can actually pre-walk that building before it's ever been built and see it in the real space and visualize these things. So it makes it super easy for all the stakeholders to come together and visualize all these things, saving countless hours, um, you know, potentially millions of dollars for all the different stakeholders involved. Um, so just tremendous applications in AEC um, and even real estate when you're trying to, you know, imagine if you're in trying to shop for housing, um, the time it takes to go from one house to the next, um, very cumbersome, very time involved. Um, and it's very hard from pictures to really, you always hear this. It's hard for me to get a gist of, yep. okay, the house in the pictures doesn't look anything like what it looked like in person. <laughs> but in yep. a mixed reality headset, you can actually see it as if you were there and get the perspective from people that are actually inside of the house. And this is just scratching the surface. There are literally millions of use cases in industry that we come across on a daily basis. And we're always surprised at some of the, the new things we see um, every day. Yeah, th I mean, those are great examples. Uh, we've got some of that here, especially in construction engineering. There's a talk later this afternoon if you want to check that out about how students were evaluating some of these building designs in, in AR on a tablet and how they were able to uh, understand the content differently than, than seeing on their 2D screen. Uh, yeah, I mean, real estate, I think almost every walkthrough now is 360 photos, right? So you can spin around on your computer, but if you did have a, a VR headset, you can, you can check it out uh, in that way. Um, can't always overcome the wide angle lens views of the small rooms, but <laughs> if you have better sense, uh, sometimes they make it look bigger than it actually is. Um, oh, that's great. Well, I wanna take a question. There was a question that popped up here in the chat that looked really interesting. Can you speak to the UX UI design in the XR space? and how someone currently working in 2D can begin working in XR. Well, I'll first say uh, Dr. Michael Niebling's course about XR for everybody, the first section for sure, is a place to get started. So if you're just interested in understanding the concepts and, and what does it look like, I'd start there. But from Microsoft's perspective, how are you thinking of UX and, and UI? Because we have a lot of students here that are in that space and beginning to think about how do I design and how do I start building these experiences uh, as an XR designer? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, there's there's a whole bunch of different facets to that that I can talk to. So the first thing is we're trying to create a set of capabilities to abstract away some of the difficulties. So you'll hear something called the MRTK, which is the Mixed Reality Toolkit. And that's a set of, of sort of widgets that you can drag and drop into worlds. So different sort of buttons, piano keys, sliders, knobs, menus that you can scroll things that you actually look at. So as you're reading, it'll automatically scroll for you and so on and so forth. So a whole bunch of primitives and libraries that will make it easier to design. So rather than having to get focused and bogged down on the design elements itself, 
people can focus on actually thinking about what it is that they want to design and build. And so we're continuously working and evolving um, to build better, more powerful tools to, to enable you to do that. Um, so that's one of the first areas is just, you know, look up online MRTK or Mixed Reality Toolkit. Um, secondly, we're actually creating a, a series of courses through, through Microsoft itself. Um, I believe it's called Designing Holograms. I would have to look up the specific name. Um, and this may be something I could sync up with Jeremy offline and see if I could get it to the audience later. Sure, that'd be great. Um, a whole series of coursework that covers what are some of the challenges and things you need to contemplate, not just on you know, designing the, you know, the items themselves, but things you need to factor in about perspectives, lighting, cameras, other challenges in designing, like you know, understanding where where's uh, you know hu where are humans going to be following, right? Understanding the human perspective and how to guide their focus through a scene because they may not always be looking where you want them to be looking. Other elements like that, and so there's courses like that um, that can also be helpful. Um, other general principles are thinking through things like Unity. Um, Unity is a very popular and common language from the video game industry. Um, that is being adopted by a lot of mixed reality developers for building very rich dynamic worlds. Um, and we pull that into a lot of the, the stuff that we build at Microsoft. Um, and then the, the last thing I would say is we have an entire developer relations group um, that's focused on doing things like running workshops and hackathons. Um, and, you know, we do a bunch of events. I'm not sure if we've had a, a recent thing at University of Michigan, um, but I can work on, on trying to get some contact information together for that as well. It sounds like something we should do in our year three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> is have a, we, we, for folks that can come to the summit in person tomorrow, you'll be able to try a number of these Microsoft experiences. There'll be some of the mixed reality Microsoft partners that have exhibits there and try on all of this. Um, well, I have one more question from the audience, and then I have a question for you. Um, I think this is a good one. We, we started to touch on it, but I don't. I think we can bring it home a little bit deeper. What? Uh, oops, it just appeared. How do we bring accessibility for lower income areas? In particular, like you, you mentioned something about 2D, I'm thinking about how you do 2D. Can you, can you describe that a little bit more, what that means if you don't have one of these, these headsets? Yeah, so th that's, that's a really interesting point. I'm glad you're bringing this up because you're right. Uh, I mean, for starters, a headset like this, I'm gonna put it on here so the camera doesn't kill it. This is around $1,500 right now. And if you get certain editions, it goes up to, I think, 5,000. The cheapest one, which is heavily subsidized, is still around $300, um, not very accessible to the majority of the world. Um, but you know, computing computers themselves have come down drastically in price. They're pretty ubiquitous. Um, and even mobile phones have become much cheaper around other parts of the world in lower income communities. Um, one of the key things we focus on when building um, our mixed reality solutions, um, uh, particularly uh, the virtual reality type things like alt space and mesh, um, is ensuring that they can run on some of these lower powered devices. So it's not going to require a high powered gaming rig. It's not going to require a super expensive uh you know, headset to run on, but it'll work on a computer with a keyboard and mouse and allow you to participate um, and roam around. So anybody who's familiar with any sort of online multiplayer game, um, Fortnite, Minecraft, the like, should be familiar with that kind of an interface. You can jump into a 3D world and feel very familiar in these types of worlds. Um, Altspace, for instance, if you wanted to play out in that right now, it's completely free. So there's no cost to, to jump in, um, no charges to buy anything in Altspace. It's a free tool to jump into the metaverse um, and it'll run on your existing computers today. Um, so you can jump in and get started right away. Another big thing is we are very focused on building an open platform. And so we don't want to tie you into any ecosystems where you're forced to use only our technology and that way we can raise prices and, and, and upcharge you for things. We're very much about working across other people's technology and other people's platforms. That's another great way to help keep things kind of open and fair. Um, so as other technologies come into play and prices start to drop because of competition, we still make sure we're open and we can play across these different platforms. And that helps level the playing field a little bit as well. I don't know if that does that kind of answer that, the question. No, that's great. That's great. And I think it's important that as designers and developers, we continue to keep that at the forefront. Of, yeah. of designing this. Well, I know we're we're just about to move into our breakout sessions. So, Jeremy, thank you so much for a great keynote, uh, a lively discussion, 
Uh, I really appreciate everything that you all are doing and, and the partnership uh, that we have with you. And again, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you for everything you're doing with XR at University of Michigan. This is amazing. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, it's at the top of the hour. And now we're going to break off into the breakout session. So if over on the left, if you see uh, the sessions tab, you can break out. We'll have two simultaneous sessions from for the next half hour. And then there's another set of sessions, 233. Come back here to the main stage at 3 o'clock, and we'll return. So uh, we'll see you all there.